Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and we are at the Experiment Designs for Computer Science course, week one, part three, and now we're going to talk about what is an experiment. Uh, in the last video, I talked a little bit about what is science and at the end of the video, I said that experiments, they take a central role in the scientific method. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the person that brought this central role to science as we know it. So I would like to talk about um, Karl Popper. Karl Popper is a, a philosopher of science. So, and like uh, many philosophers, he was very worried about what is knowledge? How do we know things? According to Popper, the way that we know things is by observing the world. We can only know things that we see happen. Uh, but he was a little bit more strict on that. It's, no, it's not good enough to just observe the world. We need to observe the world in a systematic manner. We need to create a hypothesis and to observe the world in a way that this hypothesis could be rejected. So, for example, if I tell you that I think that all cats are white, and I go outside and show there's a white cat, there's a white cat, there's a white cat, do I know that all cats are white? According to Popper, no, because going outside and looking at white cats would never falsify my idea that cats are white. I would have a very good uh, I, I would have a very good reason to believe that maybe all cats are white, but I could not affirm absolutely. If I just see one black cat, that would destroy my, my that would destroy my hypothesis. So hypothesis, scientific hypothesis, they, they have to be made so that they can be falsified, and we can only trust hypotheses like that. So what is the what are the characteristics of a good experiment? Okay, as I said before. A good experiment is based on a falsifiable hypothesis. For instance, I can say that um, there is, right here, I have a pink dragon, a pink invisible dragon. You cannot see it because it's invisible, but it's right here. Look at the dragon, it's so hot. Uh, hello, dragon. Uh, well, you can never say that the dragon is not here. You cannot see it, but I'm telling you it's invisible. So the hypothesis that I have a pink dragon right here, it's not falsifiable. Okay, now, besides that, a good experiment also has useful predictions. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but the idea of a useful prediction is that I need to predict something a little bit more than, for instance, um, the difference between I have two programs and my second program is better than the first one by 0.001 nanosecond. If that doesn't make a difference, you do that experiment, that is just a waste of time. Experiments also have data collection. In other words, we have to go out and look at the world. That's, the, that's what it means that it's an experiment and just not a proof. And also experiments should be reproducible. In other words, if I do an experiment, it should be possible for me to tell you how to do this experiment and you can do the same experiment and you should reach the same results that I did, okay? Here's a little bit of a, uh, a, a fun comic about the ideas of Popper. So here is a dialogue between Popper and Sigmund Freud. So Popper is going to Freud for therapy and Freud asks, well, tell me why you came to therapy, Popper. And so, well, honest, I don't even know, Freud. I don't really believe in these sort of things. Well, what do you mean? Well, you seem to be able to explain anything with your theories. Well, that's why it's so powerful. No, that's why it's so suspect. If a man has anxiety, you explain he was repressed as a child, or that perhaps he has unsatisfied libido, or maybe he's signaling a fear of castration. But because you don't make any concrete, testable predictions, nothing, even in principle, can falsify your theory. Interesting. You seem to have such a resistance to examining your psyche that you develop the most advanced mechanism of all. You deny the, val the validity of an entire field. 
Well, this is kind of illustrates the idea of falsifiability. Uh, Popper was lived, lived at the same time as Freud. Uh, Freud is, as some of you might know, is the father of psychoanalysis. And according to Popper, uh, psychoanalysis was not really a science because you could say anything. So if, uh, if someone was depressed, you could say that because that's because her father, they have a bad relationship with their father. But then this person said, no, I had a good relationship with my father. And then the psychoanalyst could say, whoa, but maybe you wish you were your father, but you're not. You admire him, but you wish you were him, so you're not. So whatever the person said, the, uh, the idea is that Freud would just add something extra and extra and extra. And you could never actually say that um, there was no fact that could say that psychoanalysis was wrong, so psychoanalysis was not falsifiable. Of course, there are some criticisms, but for our role here, we're going to go with this falsibility. Scientific, uh, scientific uh, hypotheses need to be falsifiable. Experiments need to be based on falsifiable hypotheses. So the idea is that a scientific hypothesis is falsifiable if there is some observation that would render it false. Like I said before, if I make the hypothesis that all cats or all birds are white, it's very easy to falsify that hypothesis. If I see one cat that is black, my hypothesis is false. I can also say that all cats, they, um, <clears throat> how can I say? I could say that all cats have four legs. And if I see a cat with more or less legs, then I, then hypothesis is, false, is, is falsified. So falsified, uh, falsifiable hypotheses, they make very specific predictions. So not the, these predictions include not only if the hypothesis is true, but also if the hypothesis were false. So if we say that algorithm A runs faster than algorithm B, we can create a hypothesis that say, the mean running time of algorithm A will be always at least half of, at most half of what algorithm B does. That's a hypothesis. The running time of algorithm B, A, is always half than the running time of algorithm B. And we can do an experiment. We can run algorithm A and algorithm B with many different data, and we can measure the running time, and we can see, oh, this algorithm A always running at half the time or less than algorithm B. And if it is, then that supports our hypothesis. But if we see that the algorithm runs slower, then that rejects our hypothesis, okay? Also, it has, like I said before, useful and strong predictions. It's not very hard to make trivial predictions about the world, especially in computer science. It's very easy to make trivial hypotheses. We're going to talk about this in the future. So the idea is that we not only want to do falsifiable hypotheses, but falsifiable and strong hypotheses. Hypotheses that we can use something about the world. We can use them to predict something about the world. Okay, now let's move on and think about experiments. So the idea is that after you do the hypothesis, you are supposed to collect data. Depending on how you collect data, there are many different ways to collect data depending on the objective of your experiment, okay? Uh, I'm gonna describe three kinds of experiments. These are not all kinds of experiments, but this is a good starting point for you. So depending on how you collect data, we can describe an experiment as an observational experiment, as a retrospective experiment, or as a controlled experiment. So let's see each of those. What is an observational experiment? An observational experiment, you obtain data by observing a phenomena without interacting with it directly. For instance, let's say that we want to know how many people um, use the train with and without masks every day. We want to know if now that people, if people are using the masks are as it's being required. So what we could do, is that we could go to Tsukuba station, we would get a notebook, and every time we see a person, we write one person with mask, one person without mask, one person with mask, one person without mask. That's an observational experiment. You go and you observe the world. 
Observe, depend, observational experiments require some care. We need to observe a representative situation. For example, if you always go to the, you know, to the scuba station in the afternoon, you are not looking at people that are going to work because they already are at work. So maybe the people in the afternoon, because they know that the train will be not be very full, they are not very worried and they don't wear masks. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they are, um, they can, maybe they are less stressed, so they make sure to wear their masks. But it's a different information that we, you would see in the afternoon and you would see in the morning. So you need to think, why are you observing this in the afternoon? Why are you not observing this in the morning? That's a decision that you have to make about your experiment. What information do you get by observing the scuba station in the morning and observing the scuba station in the afternoon? Okay? So the observational experiments allows the researcher to choose the general connection, uh, conditions for observations. One thing about observational experiments is that some events are very rare and it might be hard to observe them in an observational experiment. For instance, let's say that you want to know if uh, people with beards, people with beards, they wear masks more or less often. Well, if you go to scuba station, a lot of people don't have beards. Maybe 1% of people have beards. So it might be very difficult. Maybe you spend there one, two, three days and you don't see anyone with beards. What do you do? Okay, so that's one limitation of the observational experiment. Now, a second type of experiment is the retrospective experiment. The idea of the retrospective experiment is that instead of going out and observing, you obtain your data from historical records. For instance, new papers, reports, other scientific papers. Uh, sometimes this is called a retrospective study. Okay, so for example, let's say that you want to know that if when a celebrity marries, if that encourages other people to marry as well. So what you do is that you get a list of celebrities that have been married in the past two, three, four years. You get the average number of marriages on every day, and you see if the number of marriages after the celebrity announced their marriage increased or not. So you could do an experiment like that. And you would observe if the marriage of the celebrity affected the marriage of people. So that would be a retrospective experiment. Another example that I think it's really cool is one real, this is, a, this is a real example though. This is one research that was done about the climate change in Japan. There is one temple in Japan where they have a festival on the day, on the first day where a certain lake, uh, the water in a certain lake melts. So there is a lake in the mountains and there is a temple in front of this lake and the lake freezes in winter. And on the day that the lake melts, the temple holds a festival. And the temple would write down on the diary what was the day of the festival. So for many years, this is a very old temple. This temple has, has, has recorded the date for, of this festival for the last 300 years. So some, uh, some researchers, they took these records and they got the, the dates of the, 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 the festival and they observed that based on the days, as the uh, environment got hotter, the festival became earlier and earlier and earlier. So the date of the festival was getting earlier in the year because the lake was uh, melting quicker, quicker. And that matched the observation of temperature changes from other experiments. And that was a very interesting experiment. It was especially interesting because in more recent years, uh, they don't have the festival anymore because the lake's not freezing anymore. Anyway, um, so one thing about retrospective experiments is that it's generally cheaper to do a retrospective experiment. Why is that? Because for an observational experiment, you have to pay someone to go there and click, click, click on people. For a retrospective experiment, 
well, sometimes you have to pay to go to very specific libraries, but often you can just go and get many papers or many books to get the information that you need. In some cases, you can only do retrospective experiments. For instance, how would you do this experiment with this uh, lake that I told you about? It was over 300 years of observations. It would take 300 years for you to observe this. So you can just look at the past data instead. Okay. Of course, uh, because you're doing looking at past data, if someone did not write down the data, or if there was a mistake, then your experiment will be affected and you have to take that into account. How do you deal with these mistakes? For instance, going back to the lake experiment that I told you about, during Second World War, well, they did not have the, they did not have the festival because, well, there was a war going on. So they did not have the, the, they did not have the records for those dates. And there were other dates that also did not have records because something happened in the temple, someone died and they did not have it, something like that. So uh, there are also these limitations on the retrospective experiments. Finally, we have controlled experiment. So in a controlled experiment, the researcher defines the exact condition of the experiment and performs the experiment exactly to that conditions. Well, this is very common in computer science, and I will use the very traditional example that you have algorithm A and algorithm B, and you want to see if algorithm, what's the speed, what is the efficiency of algorithm A. So you choose, you create the algorithm, you choose the data sets, you choose the platform, you choose if the algorithm will run in your computer, or it will run in a cluster, or it will run in the cloud. You, run, you choose how many times you're going to repeat, you choose the parameters, you choose how you're gonna analyze, you choose everything, okay? So a controlled experiment gives a lot of control for the researcher. For instance, if we think about the observational experiment, I said, oh, some people don't have birds. Well, you can do a controlled experiment where you contact people who have birds and you ask them to uh, take a picture of themselves every day before they go to the metro. So, uh, that is a little bit more control. You, you're controlling who you are going to uh, observe, okay? However, with great power comes great responsibility. You have a lot of power to design your experiment, but it's very easy to insert research biases into the experiment. It also can be very expensive because you have to control the variables, you can contact more people, you have to repeat experiments, etc. Although in, in computer science, because we can run programs very cheaply, uh, sometimes it's not too expensive. Unless you're trading giant neural networks that takes thousands of, thousands of dollars to run. But yeah. Um, one thing to observe is that these are not the only three kinds. And sometimes an experiment is a little bit observational, a little bit controlled. Sometimes it's a little bit retrospective, a little bit observational. The important thing that I want you to learn is not, oh, there are three types of experiments. Is my experiment type A, type B, or type C? No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking here is that by thinking about what kind of experiment you have, you also have to think, how successful is my experiment to bias? How expensive is my experiment? What are the weak points and the strong points of my experiment? What do I have to be careful about the data that is not available in my experiment, okay? Let's talk a little bit about this. All these questions that you make about your experiment, they are called experiment design. Hey, course title, experiment design. Okay, so we're talking now about experiment design. When we perform any experiment, we have to make several technical and scientific decisions. For example, we have to decide which methods do we compare in the experiment. We have to decide which data sets we use in our experiment. We have to decide how many times we interview each participant in our experiment. We have to decide what is the order that we perform our experiments. We have a lot of data. Which data we report completely and which data do we summarize? What criteria we use to determine if our hypothesis was accepted or rejected. What parameters do we use in our programs? How many times do we repeat the experiment? And what do we do? Do we repeat the experiment and only take the last 
or do we repeat the experiment and we take the average or do we repeat the experiment and we report every single result all of these questions they are decisions that you have to make before you do your experiment this is experiment design is how you answer each of these questions experiment design depends on the type of the experiment depends on the hypothesis depends on the goal of the experiment and what try what kind of question you're trying to answer okay i'll give you some more detailed examples of what points we have to consider when we're doing experiment design okay one example that is very common is that we have to use experiment design to control for variation so let's say that we are running a computer program and we want to know how fast it runs. For example, we are developing a parallel algorithm and we want to know uh, what is the uh, parallel uh, factor? What is the parallel factor of this algorithm? How fast is algorithm run on one core? How fast is algorithm runs on two cores, on four cores, on eight cores, etc. To do that, we run the program and we measure the clock time right we measure the time from the start of the program until the end however because you are a computer scientist and you know a lot about computers you know that the running time of a program is affected for a program that will run in the background for instance you're running the program you know that it's going to take about two minutes so while the program is running you fire a game really quickly and you play your game a little bit while you run the experiment of course when you're running the game the experiment will change because the game will be loaded in the computer memory and it will share the computer processor with your experiment. Or maybe you're running an experiment for two hours and because that's too long, you take that time to look at the videos of the experiment design lecture. Well, while you're loading this vi these videos, it will be causing communica uh, network communication that may affect the running time of your experiment. Okay, so what do you do to control this? If you don't control for this, uh, maybe one program will look much faster than the others, but that's just because that program was lucky and there was no background activity while that program was running. So what could you do? One thing that you could do is you repeat this experiment. Instead of doing the experiment only one time, you do the experiment maybe 20 times and you take the average running time. And the average running time will eliminate a little bit the uh, influence of some lucky or unlucky situations that your program was executed. So this is one thing that we do in experiment design. We design our experiment and we design our data collection to remove these variation factors. Let's go for a second example. Controlling for independence. Let's say that you are in the interactive design laboratory and you are designing two different um, GUIs for websites. You have one that is, has a lot of figures and one that has no figures. And you want to know which apps website, website A or website B, which of them is easier for people to find information. Now, your idea for an experiment is this. You say, look, you tell the user, look, this is a website. And in this website, there is a receipt for chocolate cake. And you measure how many clicks it takes for the user to find the receipt for chocolate cake. There's a problem here. If after the user, if it's the same website, but only the GUI changes, after the user searches in the first website, when the user searches in the second website, the user already has some information. It knows what are the sections of the website. It knows what links it sh should click. So maybe, the user will be much faster to find the information on website on the website B because he already has some information from website B, A. In experiment design, we say that experiment A and experiment B are not independent. The result of experiment B depends on the result of experiment A. So what do you do, right? Uh, one way to do that, there are many different ways. One way to do that is that instead of always testing website A first and website B second, you could randomize this. Half of the users do website A first, half of the users do website B first. 
and you make sure that this choice is random so that you don't have any bias in that. Another way to do that is to not have all the users check both websites. You have some users only test website A and some users only test website B. That would remove the independence completely. However, that would add a different problem that, for instance, maybe many of the users that you chose to test website A, they are very familiar with computers, and many of the users that you chose to test website B are not familiar with computers. So that would go back to the previous problem and add variation to your experiment. So that's another thing that you have to be careful when you are designing your experiment. Are your experiments independent from each other? Okay, let's go for a third example. This is very common in uh, computer science, okay? Controlling for fairness. Let's say that you are developing a neural network architecture for a new vision problem. Uh, maybe you, have an ex you want to develop a program that will detect if the students are, um, if students are cheating on the test. That's a very specific problem. You have to see the, the, the direction of the head, the inclination of the head, what, if the head is looking at the test, etc. So you design a new neural network architecture and you fine tune it very carefully and you do many experiments to make sure what are the best parameters for this neural network architecture. And then after you do that, you have to show that it's better, this architecture is better than what already exists. So you take your architecture that you very finely tune, and then you get ResNet, and you get um, <clears throat> um, YoloNet, and a few other networks from online. You just download, you open like Keras, and you open um, TensorFlow, and you just uh, get the standard networks from the standard libraries and you run them and you compare with your network. Is this comparison fair? Of course it's not because the networks that you are compared against, they are not fine-tuned for your problem. Okay, so maybe they were fine-tuned to different problems and of course they will perform bad for your problem. So maybe what you're learning from your experiment is not that your network architecture is best, but that the fine tuning that you did is best. Maybe if you did the same fine tuning to the other architectures, you would figure out that the architectures are the same. Or maybe not, maybe after you do the, the same fine tuning for all architectures and you compare them, you will figure out that your architecture, your architecture has, a, has advantage anyway. So this is what we call controlling for fairness. You need to do the same sort of fine tuning and improvements that you do on your on your proposal for your competitors. You cannot do uh, you cannot only fine tune your proposal and leave your competitors to uh, to do in a in a in a disadvantaged way. That would not be that would not give you a clear image of whether your algorithm is really better or not. Okay. Okay. So. Um, all that we talk about are different ways that you can uh, design your experiment to make sure that you are getting useful information from it. There are many other choices that you have to make, and we're going to talk about these choices in future lectures. But the thing to keep in mind is that you have to define your experiment design before you start your experiment. One problem that usually happens is that you Maybe you even do an experimental design, you define how you're going to do the experiment, and then you run your experiment. But when you're running your experiment, you notice, hey, the results were not our expect. So I would change the design a little bit, and oh, the results are a little bit better now. Oh, maybe I change a few more variables, and oh, the results are even better now. And eventually, you find uh, a result that you are happy with. Now, I think, I hope you can see that this will introduce bias into the experiment. If you cannot see why this introduced bias to the experiment, think about machine learning. You have training data and test data, right? So in the training data, you are fine tuning the parameters. But in the test data, you are not supposed to fine tune the parameters because if you fine tune, then your, your, um, your machine learning, machine learning 
system will overfit to the test data and you don't know if your system is efficient or not. Well, this is very similar on experiments. If you modify your experiment after you did your experiment design, if you modify your experiment after you did your experiment design, you are overfitting to your experiment. You are introducing bias. So the idea is that you design your experiment and then you run the experiment. In that sense, we have the concept of pre-registered experiments. What are pre-registered experiments? Pre-registered experiments is when you publish your experiment design before you do your experiment. So you create your experiment design, you say, I am going to do this experiment to test this hypothesis with these parameters and this analysis. You publish that. And then you do your experiment. And after you do your experiment and you do your analysis, then you write, okay, I did this experiment that was based on this pre-design experiment and the results are so and so. By doing this, you guarantee that no biases will be introduced after you design your experiment, okay? Also, not only that, one problem that we have in science nowadays, and maybe you've heard of it, is that people think that you can only publish positive results. And in a sense, there are many conferences and many reviewers that will reject anything that is not a, public, uh, a positive result. If you don't publish negative results, what happens? Maybe you tried algorithm A and you found out that it doesn't work, but you did not publish it. So another research goes and also tries algorithm A and find out that it doesn't work. But because it doesn't work, the other research, she also doesn't publish it. And then a third researcher also thinks that the algorithm A may be useful and will try to work it, but it doesn't work and it doesn't publish it. And then we're gonna have a lot of people uh, doing this repeated work, reinventing the wheel by working on an algorithm that does not work, but because there is no publication that the algorithm does not work, they don't know. And even worse, in some cases, a coincidence, one specific set of parameters may show that the algorithm worked for that specific case, but not in general. But because that specific case was published and not the many researchers that show that it did not work were not published, people will have a wrong idea of when the algorithm worked and when it doesn't. So it's important to publish negative results and pre-registered experiments can help avoid the loss of negative results. Okay, so if you want to know more about pre-registered experiments, there's a link here on the Center for Open Science. I really recommend reading the entire description of this. Okay, the last point that I want to talk about experiments is about reproducible experiments. One of the most important points today to guarantee valid uh, experimental results is to make sure that your experiment is reproducible. A reproducible experiment means that other people can do the same experiment as yourself and they can reach the same results. In computer science, it's so easy to re have reproducible experiments. You publish the code, you publish the data, and you want to just copy the code, execute it again, there you go, experiment was reproduced. So there is no reason for a computer science developing algorithms to not do a reproducible experiment. Why do we need reproducible experiments? Well, first is that other people can confirm your results. Even if you did your result, even if you did your experiment, maybe it was luck, uh, maybe it was a very specific set of circumstances. If other people can repeat the experiment and reach the same conclusion as you, it makes your results stronger and more reliable. Another good point is that, have you ever heard of the phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. Science is made by improving about other discoveries that were done in the past. And the best way to improve on other discoveries that were done in the past is by uh, using the experiments of other people as a starting point. So if your research is reproducible, other people can use your research and can uh, build new things on it and they will cite you, which is good for your uh, curriculum, okay? All right, uh, other people can also improve your results, and more importantly, society can use our research. There is a lot of research that is lost because no one can reproduce it. 
I have many students that they read papers and say, oh, this paper is useful, but there is no code. I cannot reproduce it. I cannot use it. So that research gets lost. You're not only pub publishing your results to graduate. You're publishing your results to improve society, especially our university, because it's a public university. It's funded by taxes. It's funded by money that society has paid. So we have to give back to society. And one way to do that is to make sure that our research is reproducible, okay? All right, so now that I talked why reproducible research is important, how do you make your research reproducible? I, I, I talked a little bit about it, but let's put it on points. The first important point of a reproducible research, it's not just code, okay? You have to have a clear experiment design. So uh, you have to write detailed steps about how to perform your experiments. What are the values of relevant parameters? How the results are processed and evaluated, okay? Also, as I said before, we have open data and open source. So you have to show, if, you're, if you can publish your data, then you publish your data. If you cannot publish your data, you can publish the data acquisition protocol. In other words, how to obtain the data. Let's say that you're doing, the, uh, you're doing the, uh, an experiment using medical data. Maybe you cannot publish the data because of privacy reasons, but you can say, we obtain this data by taking 10 people that are, were in age between 30 and 40 years old. They were all males. They were all in good, condition, good physical condition. And we took their temperature every day for seven days. If you describe carefully your data acquisition protocol, other people can repeat and can get data that should be similar to yours, okay? If you are publishing your data, you publish, of course, the files of your raw data, but also the pre-processing scripts that are necessary to manipulate your data, okay? For computer science, you also have to publish your algorithm and make sure that you have good scripts that can help people reproduce your algorithm. I recommend to my students that publish not only the algorithm, but also the, the scripts that are used to execute the experiments. Nowadays, if you have a, now that we have things like Docker, you can even put a Docker container that has a run me button and you can just download the Docker container, press the run me button and you are reproducing the experiment. That's another way to do it. Finally, open documentation. Uh, when you publish your paper, publish also the scripts that you use to generate the images, the scripts that you use to generate the statistical analysis that will allow other people to see if there's any mistake in your statistical analysis or if there is any extra information that could be used or even learn from you so they can do similar things okay all right uh this is the end of the lecture so let's summarize what we studied today so we studied that experimentation is a key part of science experiments acquires data that can be used to validate or falsify scientific ideas and to answer specific scientific questions. An experiment has to be performed carefully to guarantee its ex uh, usefulness. So we have the experimental design that is the step, the first step in the experiment when we define what we are going to do in the experiment, how we are going to do it, and all the details, okay? Uh, in the experiment design, there are many decisions that you make that will affect the fairness and the meaningfulness of the experiments. And reproducibility is essential to guarantee that other people can check your experiments to make sure that they are valid. Okay, based on all of this, you are now ready to start thinking about the first report. So report one is design and execute a scientific experiment and report on your results. So we're going to do what we learned on this class and we're going to do science, okay? So the idea is that you have to choose a simple experiment to design, perform, and analyze the results. So first thing that you do is that you have to choose a scientific question. What is the scientific question that you want to answer? Why is the scientific question important for you? And it doesn't need to be important for the whole world. It's, an it's a report that you have two weeks to do. So you have to think about a report that can be done in two weeks. What kind of experiment, what kind of scientific question can you answer in two weeks? And why do you need to do an experiment? Okay, this is a scientific inquiry that requires an experiment to solve. And then 
after you do this introduction, you have to describe the experiment design of your experiment. How the data will be collected to answer your scientific question. What are the cares that you need to take? What parameters do your, uh, your experiment have? What steps did you take to guarantee that the experiment is fair, robust, and controlled? Okay. Then, after you design, then you collect the data. So you go and you have actually to do an experiment, okay? So do an experiment, describe how you did the data collection. If anything happened, so oh, I was planning to go out and take a picture outside every day for one week, but on Tuesday there was a rain and I could not take the picture, so I had to change something in my experiment, okay? So you have to describe your data collection. And finally, you have to do the analysis. So you have to describe the results in detail and what answers these results do to, to, your, to your scientific question. Now, about this last step, data analysis, next week we're going to talk about um, point indicators and um, uh, interval indicators. So you might want to use uh, information from the last, next class uh, for this last point. So I recommend that this week, you use this class to do points one, two, and three, and next week you take the information from the next class to do point four. Okay? Remember to follow the practice of reproducible science. So include any code that is necessary to run your experiment and make sure you, that you include enough information for other people to be able to reproduce your experiment. Now, a lot of students have a problem on this report. They say, okay, I don't know what experiment to do. Well, you have many options. If possible, choose something from your own research. If you choose something from your own research, like, oh, I, wanna rep I want to try to reproduce some uh, data that I saw, or I want to do some preliminary experiment about what I want to do, or I want to do some data analysis, that's best because you are not only doing the report for this lecture, you're also practicing to do experiments for your research. If you cannot do, maybe you have not decided your research topic yet, maybe you have no idea, you can also do experiments from day-to-day -day life. Students from past years, they did experiments regarding cooking techniques. Oh, is it better to cook with a frying pan or with a big pan? Or is it better to keep fruits on the fridge or, or outside of the fridge? Many different ways. So cooking is a good, I, I think the cook, uh, cooking is a great, uh, a kitchen is a great laboratory, so it's a good way to do experiments, okay? Uh, when you're, if you do, if you go this route, be very careful of measuring errors, okay? Uh, that can introduce errors in your experiment. Um, when in doubt, if you have really no idea, it's always easy to do an experiment comparing two algorithms. So you can take, if you're a process, if you're working with machine learning, you can take two different neural networks for one specific task and compare them. That's an experiment that you can do. Make sure that you choose a fair way to compare in this case, okay? One thing is very important, make sure that you choose an experiment that you can perform. A few years ago, I had one student that proposed to compare different clothes from very expensive uh, brands. And of course, that student could not buy the clothes, so she, he could not uh, do the experiments. So do, choose an experiment that you can perform. Uh, as I said in the last slide, next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about to analyze and report experimental data, but you can already start thinking about the experimental design, what experiment you want to do, and maybe start collecting some data, okay? Uh, for this, I have some recommended reading. So the first leading, the first uh, link, Understanding Science, talks a little bit about what I said in the previous video about science as a living organism, as an interactive process. The comic that I showed in this lecture, it comes from Existential Comics. It's a very good uh, web comic series that talks about different philosophers. Um, so I really recommend that you go and read and learn a little bit more about philosophy. Uh, there are two series of videos, uh, Crash Course, sociology and the scientific method and crash course sociology research methods they talk about a lot of things that i talked today about how to do an experiment how to design an experiment it's focused on social sciences but i think it's even better 
because you can see that the same principles that I talk here, they apply for computer science, they apply for medicine, they apply for social sciences. So make sure to take a look at those two videos. The link for these videos will be on GitHub, on Manaba, and maybe on the description of this video as well. All right, and this is the end of the lecture. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment or leave a message in Manaba. See you uh, next week.